Welcome to the GIST technology, um, to GIST Tech Connect. Um, my name is Tierney Teese, and I'll be your host for today's program. Before we get started, I'd like to welcome Deputy Assistant Secretary for Oceans and International Environment and Scientific Affairs, uh, Maxine Burkhart. So we'll hand it over to her. Thank you so much. Um, really great to be here. Thanks, Tierney, for the introduction, for introducing me briefly, and, and welcome everyone to the Global Innovation through Science and Technology or GIST initiative, uh, the Tech Connect webinar on elevating diverse voices in ocean advocacy and innovation. As mentioned, my name is Maxine Burkhead and I'm the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Oceans, Fisheries and Polar Affairs at the US Department of State's Bureau of Oceans and International Environmental and Scientific Affairs. Lots of, lots of uh, long title, um, big responsibilities over in our bureau. So I oversee the State Department's work in ocean policy and related programs. And as part of that, I take seriously my responsibility to advocate for diverse voices in ocean science and technology. I'm joining you from Lisbon on the occasion of the UN Ocean Conference, where the United States is among many other commitments, showcasing its commitments to diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, which are at the core of the Biden-Harris administration's agenda. Science and technology innovation is critical for solving the world's greatest challenges, including those threatening the health of our ocean uh, and uh, issues of diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility um, that are often most challenged, but are also very much keys to our success. I would like to take a brief moment to touch on a couple examples of how the Biden Harris administration is leading in these efforts. At the national level, the United States Federal Ocean Policy Committee is exploring ways to further environmental justice policies in its broad mandate of ocean policy work. And we hope our success in this regard will be an example for international partners that may seek to accomplish the same. And the United States also demonstrates international leadership in elevating diverse voices throughout the ocean s and enterprise. We commend countries that have taken steps to ensure all individuals, including women, indigenous persons, and marginalized populations, have appropriate access to environmental information, the opportunity to participate and lead in decision-making processes, including in the early stages of infrastructure and other development, as well as the effective access to judicial and administrative proceedings. Elevating diverse voices within ocean s and benefits us all. And the GIST initiative is an ideal tool for us to convene groups like this to discuss ways to accomplish meaningful diversity, equity, inclusion, and access for the benefit of all. I have no doubt that today's discussion will be robust and inspiring toward that end. And I hope you all enjoy this event and I encourage you to ask questions of the panelists and engage with each other as we continue on this journey together. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, Wise words, yes. Well, um, thank you again, everyone, for joining us for, for this Just Tech, Tech Connect. Um, I'd, like to, um, I'd like to also just reiterate that, you know, human health and economic prosperity and a stable climate, they all depend on having a healthy ocean. Without a healthy ocean, we don't have a healthy planet. It is our vascular system. Um, yet we are having Im immense impacts on, the, on our ocean. And it's vitally important that we pull together to, to work together to find innovative solutions. Um, for today's Tech Connect, GIST has invited several of the ocean's most diverse and outspoken and wonderfully um, eloquent advocates to share their journey to creating movements that have begun to protect our ocean and can incorporate sustainable practices into their startups or their ideas. So um, we, are, we are coming to you today from, live from Lisbon, Portugal, in tandem with the United Nations Ocean Conference that just opened up earlier this week. And I'd like to begin by introducing our fellow, um, my fellow expert panelists, Daniela Fernandez, is the founder and CEO of Sustainable Ocean Alliance, an award-winning social entrepreneur, a thought leader, and an international speaker on the entrepreneurial mindset, ocean innovation and technology, youth empowerment and sustainability. You cover a lot of bases there, Daniela. <laughs> um, Armin Alex is a recognized science communicator and ocean steward from Corpus Christi, Texas. He currently serves as the vice chair of the mayor's environmental task force, is one of the youngest on the board of directors for Earth Echo International, 
a science communications TED Talk speaker, and is the co-executive director of the Gulf of Mexico Youth Climate Summit. And um, I don't think, did I introduce myself? I don't think I did. I'm um, Tierney Teese, a National Geographic Explorer, biologist, filmmaker, and a research associate at the California Academy of Sciences. I'm also the founder and director of Around the World in 80 Fabrics, a nonprofit dedicated to sharing the cultural and biodiversity of natural fiber textiles, looking for sustainable solutions to non-petroleum um, textiles. So with, without further ado, I'd like to um, thank you both for coming, Armin and Daniela. And, um, I should also mention that for our, um, our live in-person audience, if you have a question for our panel, please write it down on the paper provided to you or raise your hand and our GIST, our wonderful GIST staff will, will collect those questions and we can answer them. So let's start um, by, by maybe we can start with a little bit about um, how, how, what started you on your journey, Daniela? Can you, can you tell us how you came into this vocation? Happy to. And my journey actually goes back to when I was a 12 year old kid uh, living in Chicago. I loved, well, I love penguins just generally because they're amazing creatures. And I remember walking home from school and seeing a poster. And this poster was an image of penguins walking on sand, which at the time was very confusing for a 12 year old. And that led me to run to Blockbuster, you know, back then when we actually had video stores, I rented the movie and the film was an inconvenient truth. And you can imagine my shock thinking I was going to watch a penguin movie <laughs> to learning about climate change. And, and truly that's what, that's what changed my life. I saw that film and I just knew that I would dedicate the rest of my life to helping protect our planet Little did I know what it would turn into. I just knew I had that, that passion, I would say, or that responsibility on my shoulders at that point. And so I you know, went through my entire educational career. I learned about environmental science. I raised the funding to get my high school solar panels. I educated myself about the, the, the environmental crisis. And then when I attended a meeting at the United Nations um, as a freshman in college, that's when I had two big realizations. One of them being that I was one of the youngest person in the room and the information was simply not leaving that meeting. Everything was happening behind closed doors. And so I felt there was a big gap in the space and involving youth and involving our generation that needed to know what was happening um, behind these meetings. And second of all, I also realized that Every single person in that room talked about how bad things were. They talked about the statistics, the, the problems, but no one got up and spoke about solutions. And so my, I would say the genesis of my organization, Sustainable Ocean Alliance, was trying to find a way to bridge the gap of getting youth involved and also having them build solutions for our ocean and our climate. Mm. Oh, I love, <clears throat> I love that story. I, in, inconvenient truth certainly resonated with me as well. And the, well, the fact that you brought solar panels to your high school this was <laughs> so resourceful at such a young age well they're and i think there. <laughs> they're still there and they're still working that's great that's great um i think well you share this um you know achieving at a young age and 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 putting putting youth front and center and getting a seat at the table i think you certainly share that with armin armin can you tell us a bit about your journey as well Absolutely. Uh, just once again, thanks for letting me be here today and speak to you all. Um, so my journey is somewhat similar to the same. So I grew up in Corpus Christi, Texas, uh, right along the coast. The Corpus Christi Bay was my neighbor and the Gulf of Mexico is my backyard. Um, and it was an equitable approach ever since I was very young. So I, I, I have fond memories of walking along the shoreline with my father at the age of you know three and two years old. Um, so that connection to a big body of water, um, an ocean source, a life source has been there since the beginning. And we used to play games like, you know, collecting seashells, who could collect the most, um, how much seaweed we could, we could count along a mile uh, of the shoreline. Um, or you'd even play the game of, you know, how many ships we would see go in and out of the, the port of Corpus Christi in our downtown area. 
And I think that even from a really young age, I've always had this connection with our ocean. And I grew up watching documentaries uh, with, you know, hosted by Jacques Cousteau and seeing Al Gore speak. Um, Al Gore was a, a huge, um, you know, idol for even my mom and my, my father who weren't necessarily the, the best environmentalist, but definitely did care about the natural world. Um, and so they instilled some of those ideas in, into, you know, younger Armand. Um, that being said, uh, in terms of, you know, looking at the, the ships in our bays in our area, I remember there being a time when I was little where in just maybe about five minutes of time, we would only count maybe five, six ships that would go in. Um, now it's 2022, about 15 years later, and we're seeing at least 50 to 75 within five minutes. That's insane. Uh, Corpus Christi actually has the fifth largest of the fifth largest port in the United States. And I say that because these are statistics and facts that I didn't know when I was younger, uh, because I took it upon myself to educate um, and teach others about the ways that we interact with the environment, um, those were things that I, I grew up on. And those are the ideas that I have in terms of how I would like our organization to be run. It's, it's through education, it's through policy practice, and it's through advocating for the issues that we face here as a region, but then also understanding that the impacts and the activities that we do here in Corpus Christi have a larger uh, impact and range on the global scale as well. Um, and so I have a lot of practice with working with uh, conservation and environmental nonprofits from the international perspective. And one of my biggest joys is you know, traveling the world um, listening of best practices from other regions, other frontline communities, and bringing it back here to Corpus Christi, where I know I can make real substantial local change. Um, and that way we can also be a, a leader in these spaces for what an ocean community um, in the United States can look for. Um, but that's a little bit about my journey. Now, I, you know, I'm involved uh, in terms of science communications. I went to school for environmental science, marine biology. And now I really love to talk about the science. I did some research in jellyfish and water quality. I understood that I don't want to be stuck in a lab. I just really love communicating and connecting with the public. Um, you know, when I was in high school, I started volunteering at the Texas State Aquarium. I, I got an internship there. And that's where I really learned to love connecting people with wildlife. And that also, and even in a coastal community, not everyone understands best practices for sustainability, how to interact with the environment. Um, and that was where I understood there was a gap. And so those are some of the things that I keep in mind whenever we work as an organization here in the region, but all throughout the Gulf Coast. Yeah, oh, I love that. I mean, that's, um, I think it's so important, these experiences we have as youngsters that instill in us um, a love of, of being outdoors and in nature. And I think it's, it's I mean, we have to instill that, that love early on in our youth um, for them to then wanna protect it as, as they get older. Um, my journey is, is, is somewhat similar to both, both of yours. Um, I certainly grew up just loving, loving the ocean, loving biology and wanting to just, it just, there was no other pathway. I just wanted to study biology and, um, and did my PhD studying, studying fish and, and, stud and tracking them around the planet, but kept seeing more and more plastic entering into the environments and into my study animals. And the realization that I was shedding plastic microfibers off my clothing led me to start a nonprofit around the world in 80 fabrics. And um, it's certainly not about me, this nonprofit, it's about elevating the voices of all sorts of cultures and communities that are creating solutions to non to, to our petroleum based fabrics. So, and many of them are, are women, women powered communities. So lifting those voices across the planet from indigenous to, um, you know, cutting edge technology. So, so yes, definitely um, parallels there. And the importance of diverse voices being a, a huge unifying factor in our journeys. Um, I'm wondering, um, maybe Daniela, could you could you tell us, um, you know, that you know, often we have female voices and youth that are underrepresented, you know, especially left out of the dialogue in ocean protection. So, so how does Sustainable Ocean Alliance sort of bring those voices together and 
and, and share them. Well, I'm happy to share a very concrete example, given that we just finished uh, hosting the, the, the UN Innovation Forum uh, for youth. So we brought in uh, over 150 youth delegates from over 60 countries that for many of them, it was their first time leaving their countries. It was their, their first time being exposed to this high level convening. And I'm, I'm currently just so happy and filled with joy and, and love in my heart because seeing all these incredible youth voices come together and understanding that they do have a place in these convenings and, they, and their opinion and their ideas do matter. I think that's a part of empowerment that we just need to focus so much more our time and effort in. It's not good enough to have a young person speak on stage at a UN convening for the sake of a photo op. Um, we really need to understand why they're there, what their ideas are, what their concerns are, and how they're bringing that to the table. So one of the components of this forum was to have them build solutions on the spot. And they spend 24 hours on the beach, literally coming up with ideas. And I'm really happy to say that two projects won and they each got $15,000 to now go forth and actually implement these ideas. And so I think that you know, the, the importance in, in bridging that inequality gap is allowing these opportunities for youth from, from diverse communities, from, from places where they otherwise would not have you know, the privilege to be in these convenings, you know, to fly all the way to Portugal, you know, to stay at a hotel, you know, for, for they're here for about 12 days. I mean, these are all like very large expenses and they're very, you know, outside of the, of the reach of a lot of youths. And so I think that enabling that opportunity for them has been life-changing. And I also think that it's going to be life-changing for the UN as a construct, because we are infiltrating um, the forum, you know, the actual UN conference now with youth voices. There's 150 youth out there right now, networking, meeting with their ambassadors, you know, speaking their own mind and sharing their own perspective of how, what needs, what needs to happen. Um, I'll, I'll share, I'll close my, my brief remarks here with, um, a question. So we had one of our youth leaders um, ask a question to uh, to the the president of Portugal um, and to the UN, you know, general secretary after their remarks. And her question was, "What's next? What are you going to do about all of this?" Uh, so seeing their 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 you know their understanding of the problem and also the urgency that we all feel to solve this is something that is refreshing and something that is needed. And so I would say to elevate youth voices, we just need to remove barriers, empower them, give them access to funding, capital, and, and access to these incredible platforms to make their own voices heard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. So it's so exciting to, to be filled with, you know, with that energy right there. And, and to, to get over this, um, you know, tokenism that you have someone there just to, to fill a quota and to, to showcase that this is some sort of, that you're diverse, but actually have a vested interest in having a place at the table. Um, so, and, and providing the capital, as you say, um, such amazing things can, can transpire from that. Armin, what do you have to add to that? I completely agree. That was amazing. Uh, I think that, you know, even from a, a young age, uh, in, in terms of being just completely in awe with the, the ocean and the bay in my backyard, um, I understood a, a, a very real example of what biodiversity means in, in the importance of diversity. Uh, Corpus Christi Bay has some of the um, you know, all tops of marine ecology in the bays and beaches, and and you can see it from the jellyfish to the fish um, to some large mammal, uh, large mammals like the dolphins in our area. And understanding that young people have a special place in any room. I often found myself being the youngest person uh, in our in either at the city level um, in organizations. I am a result of organizations investing in, in young people and investing in young leaders. Um, and so I found myself in many rooms where I am, am often the youngest uh, by a, a massive range. And I know how powerful young people can be in terms of creating real change, whether it's social change um, or the necessary innovate, innovative ideas that we can bring to the table to change systemic um, 
to influence systemic change. And I knew that the, you know, the, the Gulf of Mexico, it, it was going through, you know, certain environmental issues being <clears throat> uh, impacted by climate change. You know, one of the most significant ways that the Gulf of Mexico impacts global patterns, it's through its currents. And the Gulf Stream is a powerful current that brings warm water from the Gulf of Mexico into the Atlantic Ocean. It directly impacts weather patterns for areas like the eastern coast of the US and even as far as Europe. And so I knew that here in the Gulf Coast, we have a, we, we have a role to play in the big picture of, of biodiversity, of the device versus we can use. And as a coastal community, mainly, we're on the front lines. Uh, and so we have to understand how those specific uh, perspectives are either being left out of the conversations or are needed in those conversations. So by understanding our role in the global picture and then understanding that our perspectives are unique in its own and young frontline communities also, um, you know, as, as a young person who is also Latino and Black, it's important to me to be in these conversations because for years we have been left out. Um, not even just as a young person, but yes, absolutely as a young person too. We are, you know, the product of, you know, generations before us that have been trying to invest in the education, invest in the type of resources that we have as young people, as young conservationists, as young environmentalists. And so if, if all the investments are some of the investments were there for my generation, um, then trust in us that we are educated enough uh, that we are experienced enough to be able to go into these conversations with, you know, maybe older generations where, where it's dominated in a room um, to create some, some make some waves, uh, pun intended, to really make some waves. Uh, and I've seen it been, being done. You know, just recently I was invited to um, the Our Ocean Conference over in Palau. Palau is a small island nation located in the Western Ocean Pacific in Micronesia. And it's known for its pristine crystal blue waters and over 200, you know, volcanic coral islands filled with some of the most diverse and abundant ecosystems. But most importantly, um, it's a frontline community, population of only 18,000 people or so. Uh, and they are experiencing some of the worst effects of climate change by sea level rise, ocean acidification and pollution. Um, and this is just an example of another voice that's, that's being left out of the table. But for us being there, we were able to learn some of the most amazing ocean-based solutions to address climate change. I could go on and on about the, you know, the, the, the loss of, of, of what's, what's being lost when you don't include diverse voices at the table, but young people and coastal communities, we have been left out of those conversations. And it's amazing to see organizations and, and conferences invite us, not just as uh, a tokens, as Daniela said, but as, as key stakeholders and, and influencers in those spaces. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree with you more, Armin. Um, we need to get, you know, where the problems are occurring, the people who are living there, living in the trenches, on, you know, not in some, um, you know, bureaucratic building far removed from what's actually happening. We need to empower those voices who are experiencing these, these issues up, up front and center because they're the ones who can then, you know, take responsibility and, and implement solutions and, and bring these things to where they need to be. Um, I know that we have a lot of um, innovators tuning in today and um, people interested in startups. And I'm wondering if, um, if both of you could talk to how, how you know, there's, there's many people interested in creating startups without the ocean in mind. What might you, um, what might you, say to, to, to inspire people to do startups with more, taking more of ocean help into, into account and um, persuading them. With, on, my, on my end, <clears throat> textiles touch everything. Not only are microfibers um, shedding off in, in every wash load and, and dryer, but also the greenhouse um, emissions. And I know, Daniela, you said you like penguins. There's, um, there's an interesting study that just came out with, with penguins, the, in the blood of a deli penguins, they found chemicals from the Aral Sea, which is a direct result of over extraction of the water of the Aral Sea for cotton production. And that's lowered the level so much that it's exposed the seabed or the lake bed 
with all its pollutants and pesticides, that's become into the air and then it's all the way down in Antarctica. So our, our ways of manufacturing spread across the planet. Um, and the ocean being downhill from downstream from everything is a part of that. But I'm wondering, I'm, I'm wondering, um, Danielle, if you could talk to how to, how you would, um, you know, entice other startups with, with taking the ocean into account. Definitely. Well, that's, that's part of the reason why I started Sustainable Ocean Alliance, because I realized that there wasn't a platform or a place where ocean solutions can go to and become accelerated, you know, in the, in the, in the Silicon Valley terminology, in the sense that you become accelerated when you have access to an investor network, where you have access to capital, where you have access to mentors, you have access to resources and media. And so when I started the organization, there were a lot of young people that had these incredible ideas for for-profit startups that would benefit the ocean. And yet there wasn't a home for them. There wasn't a place where they could receive all of, all of these access and all of this education. And so we actually launched the first ever ocean accelerator program to provide this quality support that these ocean entrepreneurs needed. And, you know, going, maybe it's taking a step back and just on a macro level, my theory around ocean innovation is that, or I would say ocean and climate innovation is that we have such a unique opportunity right now to disrupt every single industry. It's an exciting time for young people because whether it be shipping or fishing or textiles or fashion or, or communication or education, there is so much work to get done because we have to re-engineer these business models that have been set up to harm our planet, that have been set up to put profit over people and the environment. And now we have a choice to make. And that choice is how can you create a new type of business model, a new technology, a new product, a new service that is actually going to live in harmony with our planet, that is actually going to support the healing and the regeneration of our planet instead of instead of killing off everything you know, we have lived for. And so I think that I would encourage the innovations, the ideas. I think now we, we just need more, a lot more people to get into the space, um, to think about how their own talents and their own skill sets can contribute. You don't have to be a marine biologist. You don't have to be an oceanographer to innovate in the climate and ocean space. Myself, I am a um, government and economics major <laughs> that you know was very much interested in the policy and politics space. And I learned my way into the ocean space. So I think there's also a need for people to not be afraid of their lack of knowledge as being uh, an obstacle for them, but rather to just open up and be vulnerable and say, these are all the things I don't know. This is what I need a community to help me with. And this is my idea. And then let's build these amazing technologies that, that truly need to revolutionize every sector of the economy. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I you're, you're hitting the nail on the head with so, so many of these things. And I think also, you know, listening to, taking a note out of, out of nature's playbook as well. So keeping that whole life cycle in mind when we, do, when we do innovate and create new materials to keep the whole life cycle assessment there. So it's not just getting your, your material for, or your product from point A to point B to please your stakeholders but getting it so that you have a holistic understanding of when you put your product out there, how is it going to interact with the world? How is it gonna degrade? How much waste is it gonna create? And how can, we, how can we turn that waste into something useful and, um, and work with a zero waste mindset? So I think that's, um, I think that's so, so critical. And disrupting every industry. Couldn't agree with you more. I mean, it's such a time for, for innovation and, and potential. We have so many tools in, um, you know, in biology with synthetic biology. We can build better with biology. Build, we can build um, cement um, with, and concrete with biology um, with a much lower, lower carbon footprint. So from the building industry to the textiles to everything in between. So, um, so, so, so certainly. Um, Armin, how, how have you helped inspire people to take up an ocean cause um, if they're if they're looking for you know creating a startup have you have you um, been able to convince people in that in that realm 
Well, let's see. Uh, in terms of startups, you know, back in 2019, um, at the time I was, uh, uh, I was in my second year of university and I had just come across this um, specific study in the, the Gulf of Mexico looking at um, the dead zone. Um, so we got the Mississippi that runs through the majority of the United States uh, as far north as the state of Minnesota touches straight down and, and filters out into uh, the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and throughout of all of these, you know, agricultural practices, runoff, oil and gas, um, it, it creates, you know, eutrophication in the area of the Gulf of Mexico, it creates these dead zones. There's just, there was too much nutrients. The, you know, the algae takes over and it, it, it kills the fish. It kills the, bi you know, that biota in the area. And um, it wasn't completely off my radar, but I was, uh, at the time, I had just come across this study that was looking at the next 10 years of what these dead zones can look like. Um, and it was going hand in hand with some of the predictions from climate scientists basically saying what we already know. The world is a, the, 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 the atmosphere, the planet right now is in a, is in a bad place. And uh, if it continues to be perpetuated as such, um, the dead zones in the Gulf of Mexico, um, you know, it, it, it's not going to be okay. They're going to, they're going to, grow, uh, exponentially grow. And, uh, you know, the Gulf of Mexico provides at least 30% of the United States seafood. Um, so there were a lot of things that I, I had recognized that would be problems specifically from this dead zone. But then I go on, you know, I, I spoke to some friends and family and I realized that there was just a real lack of awareness of how important this big body of water is to the United States, especially within the Gulf Coast. Um, the, the, the coastal states in the United States, they typically forget uh, how vital this specific source of, of, of energy, source of life is to the everyday life that we are. I, I, as fisheries, um, as, as energy resources, uh, there's multiple impacts that, came, that, that come from this. And that being said, when I went, when myself and my partner founded the Gulf of Mexico Youth Climate Summit. It was based on the foundation that young people are powerful enough to be able to change systems, but also inspire other people. And so I thought, I'm, I'm really big on this. If, a, if an organization isn't founded on just equitable and right practices, then the work that you do you're doing the wrong work. <laughs> That's as simple as I see it. If you don't have a strong foundation in your organization that looks at sustainability, that is that is rooted in the best practices approaches for people over profit, then you're doing the wrong work. And so I, I at the heart of our organization for uh, the Gulf of Mexico Youth Climate si uh, Summit, it is to specifically empower other young people but to also educate about the issues that are going on in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, because we understand that if we're able to, you know, push or, or put young people in the places of power, uh, where, where power has, has, has been designated, that we can actually create real comprehensive change. Like with every major social movement that we've seen around the world, there's always been a powerful young component to it. Mm -hmm. And so we saw that there was a, a lack of, young people power uh, fighting for the Gulf of Mexico. And so we wanted to, instead of, you know, waiting for just another seat at the table, we created a table of our own. And, I, and I'm, I'm really happy to announce that the Gulf of Mexico has been uh, invited to uh, speak with all the young leaders that we have to, to many different um, or, um, events around the US. Specifically, I, one that comes to mind is the Consortium for Ocean Leadership and NOAA came together to plan the next 10 years of ocean exploration. And they, they invited GOMIX, which is the Gulf of Mexico Youth Climate Summit. They invited GOMIX there to provide the youth perspective that is needed. Um, anyway, so I think that if an organization doesn't have the right footing, doesn't take the right first step, and that's looking at what you're, you're grounded in, then the work that you're doing, it, isn't up to date with what is needed right now in terms of the demand for social equitable change and uh, approaches uh, to you know the innovative solutions that we need to help protect the planet. Yeah, yeah. No, I think um, I think you you provide a great uh, a great case study 
that can be applied across the, uh, across the world with the Gulf of Mexico there. You know, it's not just, not just getting a seat at the table. If there's no seat at the table, then make the seat at the table, <laughs> make a new table <laughs> and invite people to your table. Um, so, so yeah, that's great, great case study there that's applicable widely. Um, Danielle, I'm wondering if you could talk about perhaps some of these solutions that, um, that you've come across that excite you the most, what, that give you hope and make you optimistic because you, you're embedded in, in so many of those up and coming ideas. So just last month, we put out a report that showcases 222 ocean solutions. I would encourage all of you to go out there and take a look at it. It's, um, it's a, a Sustainable Ocean Alliance impact report. And what is amazing is that these solutions are real and they're they're doing the work right now. They're not just white papers, they're not theories. They're actually out there in the ocean, changing things for the better of the ocean. And um, I'll give you a couple of examples. You know, I do feel like a, like a mother with my 222 that I can't pick a favorite per se, but I'll give you a couple of examples of the ones that are, are truly revolutionizing their, their own industries. One example is of a company called Cruise Foam. And what Cruise Foam does is they are, they found a way to use the materials in chitin to replace styrofoam as a material because styrofoam is a material that doesn't biodegrade at all. It actually lives on forever. And so now they found this, this, um, this material in chitin to be able to now replace it. And, and it's just the beginning of, you know, them, they're working with, with car companies, they're working with, um, you know, transportation companies to find ways to replace their style from usage. And, and to me, that's just revolutionary because, it's, again, it's, it's, it's Mother Nature giving back, uh, you know, part of, of what it's used naturally that we can use into, into our ecosystem. Another company that I'll share is um, Blue Ocean Gear. What they're doing is they're using IoT technology and buoys and attaching these GPS sensors to fishing nets. I mean, how, how simple, but how brilliant is it? Because fishermen, when they go out into the sea, they throw out these fishing nets, which then contribute to the plastic pollution problem that we have and the pollution problem that we have, you know, all over the world. So now these fishermen can actually go and retrieve the fishing nets from the ocean by using this GPS system that in the past simply didn't exist. And so you're giving the fishermen the economic benefit of not having to buy a new fishing net, but you're also preventing that to, from being a, a pollution into the ocean. So and very, I would say it's very simplistic concepts at times that simply have not been considered or put together um, that can just change an entire industry. And, and the last one I'll give you is, um, is a company called Lollyware. And what Lollyware is doing is they're using seaweed to replace plastic as a material. So they're creating plastic uh, seaweed straws to replace plastic straws as their first one. And they're moving on to doing um, film and other types of you know, um, utensils and cutlery. So it's so exciting to see that we can utilize the amazing nature um, and, and the resources that we have to change our bad habits and to change the products that are harming our environment. And, and one thing I'll also mention is we also have, in addition to the for-profit solutions, we have nonprofit grassroots projects. So we have youth leaders planting mangroves, uh, which will contribute to blue carbon. We have young leaders planting coral reefs. And so it really, it really speaks volumes to, to asking our youth what actually matters in your own communities and, and truly taking the, the approach of listening to what their concerns are, understanding what their solutions are, as opposed to us coming in, you know, as, as folks that have an idea and tell them how to implement it. It's the other way around. We have to hear what their needs are, what their solutions are, what their ideas are. And all we're here for is to support them and to accelerate them and to help them implement them in their own communities. Yeah, no, I am. Um, I love I love all these solutions. We have so many new techniques and technologies at our at, at our disposal. I mean, when you talk about putting GPS on on fish nets, there's also groups that are trying to redesign the netting so that it biodegrades and it doesn't just ghost fish for for decades afterwards. Um, and with chitin, there's there's numerous companies looking at chitin as this, this resource and being able to then genetically engineer those same properties into, into yeast and bacteria so they can crank out a lot of this material um, at an industrial scale. There's, um, I was just uh, attending the Biofabricate Sim Summit in Brooklyn, um, New York last, um, last month. 
and there's Tom Tex and Squid Tex, and they're they're also incorporating um, shellfish waste um, and and squid squid proteins into making new materials that can that can biodegrade and make you know I think we need to make make materials that don't last longer than we do um, when they when that's not in their design criteria so so I think we really need to listen to nature there um, and and do better in in that space and certainly lots of people looking at seaweed seaweed such a such a great feedstock as it is such a carbon sink, it can work to bioremediate. Um, and with mangroves also being able to buffer coastal communities from storms, which we're just gonna get more of as we move into warmer temperatures. So it's a win-win so often when you can take natural um, inspiration from the natural world. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, I know that many, um, many folks listening here would be interested in how you've managed to find the funding to do the kind of work that you're doing. That's always the, that's always the sticking point. How do you get the, the capital to then be able to then run a, an accelerator program or run a competition or get everyone at the table that you want? All right, can, maybe we'll start with you, Armin. Have, have, you, have you any um, advice for, for startups as to fundraising techniques or innovations that you've, you've come across? Or? Well, funding is always such a, a big thing whenever it comes to organizations, uh, especially yeah. nonprofits. Uh, and so I'm glad that this question was included here, uh, especially because, you know, when I was younger, my dad thought I was going to be an entrepreneur. Uh, you know, I was always coming up with like little, you know, like little gigs here and there, selling bracelets at school that I would make at home. So I was just like this little, this little uh, innovative child. Um, and my dad thought I was going to be an entrepreneur. And, and I say that because I remember when I was little, I, mean, I don't know, maybe at the age of like nine or 10 years old, I had this awesome idea that um, one day I came from, came back from home and I was like doodling in my notebook and I came up with this great idea for an underwater, uh, an underwater, I guess it was like a, a little underwater Vespa. It had like a little shield, it's like this underwater scooter. And it was just a, you know, a, a little innocent kind of idea that I had when I was little. Um, and I saw this infomercial. It was like, I don't know, 1-800-Invent-Help or something along those lines. And I was like, that's it. At, the, at 10 years old, I, I thought that I was gonna call that phone number and that they were gonna invest in my, my, my piece of paper that had a doodle on it. And it was gonna be the best thing ever. Cause I, even at that age, I understood if I want to make this possible, I was going to need money. And so it's so important for organizations to have it. Uh, long story short, I called the phone number, nobody answered and the underwater scooter Vespa does not exist. Um, but anyways, so in, in terms of like GOMIX in the Gulf of Mexico Youth Climate Summit and some of the organizations that I've worked with in the past, um, a lot of the times we rely on grant writing. Uh, so if you are putting together an organization and um, you know, grant writing either coming from federal or state government or even some like local institutions in your area, I would completely recommend to either invest in your grant writing skills or actually pay someone who understands the practice of grant writing. Um, because it is, you know, when it comes to specifically applying for grants, there's like a specific lingo you kind of fit into. And at the university, I specifically took a course on technical writing and it specifically talked about grant writing and some of the best language to use um, and so that was just one way that we were able to get grants and then of course scholarships and then also can we just take a second to appreciate Daniela's organization for being able to sponsor so many creative and innovative ideas that are really making change for our planet and communities that it, that they uh, impact. Um, so SA, SOA in terms of at least like, uh, you know, technological like technological um, inventions, it would be a great start. But if you're an organization nonprofit that are looking at um, you know, uh, looking at making like social change or systemic change in your area, um, you know, grant writing is a big one. And, and I can say that because that's a, where a lot of the majority of our, our funding comes from is grants. Okay, great. Well, can we, um, <clears throat> we have some questions from the audience um, that we'd like to incorporate um, in our remaining minutes. Um, Daniela, <clears throat> do you have any plans to scale SOA in Africa? specifically Egypt. Egypt has a lot of resources on the Marine Coast. 
So any plans for Egypt? Very timely question because <laughs> We actually have uh, an Egypt SOA hub, and we have a number of SOA young leaders that came up to me recently, and they said, Daniela, can we build an SOA Middle East hub? So yes, we are working on that after this youth forum. And so the goal is to um, bring about a Middle East presence and we can have more youth, we can have more solutions in Africa, absolutely. We're also, we also have hubs in Africa. And now it's just a matter of, of finding the youth leaders that are out there. So if you are a youth leader that wants to join SOA, have a hub, they're like, please reach out to us. We are actively scaling our efforts. And one announcement that we made yesterday is that we've actually been able to secure $15 million um, in our goal to, re to raise $100 million to fund Ocean Solutions. And so um, we are, we're ready, we are ready to, to give, we're ready to fund and support you. And so now truly um, the turn is on, on our youth leaders to come to us with ideas, with projects, with innovations, um, and they can be for-profit and they can also be grassroots research, um, community-led projects, we fund, we fund it all. <laughs> so please do reach out and be a part of our community. Um, and, you know, and also if I might, if I may just respond to the funding piece of it, because I think yes. that that's something that, um, you know, as an investor, I get asked all the time, and I would love to just provide some insights. You know, the first thing is around the mentality of perseverance. You have to continue going. You're going to get so many no's. You're going to have so many doors shut in front of you. But the reality is that you have to continue working and asking and meeting people, and you simply can't give up. I mean, that's the the nature of being an entrepreneur is you have to continue finding your community, finding your people. Um, on a practical note, I would say reach out to as many funders as you can. You know, put together your pitch, your deck, send it out. Um, and advice number two would be clarity. Make sure you have a very clear message as to what value you're bringing into the ocean space, into the climate space. Why you? How are you different? How are you going to add value to the entire community? Um, oftentimes we see these amazing ideas, but they're just so complex and confusing that if you can't get your message across, invest in public speaking, invest in clarifying your, your thinking so you can truly you know, do a 30 second elevator pitch <laughs> with someone you meet anywhere and they can be inspired by your concept, be inspired by your thinking. And, and the third thing I would say is just truly be vulnerable. I, I found so many people that think, oh, I can't be an entrepreneur because I don't know finance or I don't know legal or I, I've never asked for money. Trust me, I didn't know anything about any of that either. I was just a college student that graduated. I never intended to be an entrepreneur or the CEO of a global nonprofit. And the reality is that the first thing I would always say is I don't know, I need help. So I surrounded myself with mentors, with people that actually were experts in the subject matter that I needed help with. And I rallied them around me. They became my brain trust and they supported me along the journey. So I would say find mentors, find people that believe in you as a person, not on your idea, on you as you know what your values are, what you're willing to do in this world. Um, and that's the, the only way for you to start and, and investing in yourself, investing in your project, and then looking to, to make a, a, a difference in this world. Oh yeah, I, excellent, excellent advice. Um, this is getting a little granular, but um, do, does SOA provide sort of um, example pitch decks? Um, and because pitch decks are so critical for selling your idea and making sure they're not too long, making sure they're just technical enough, making sure they convey what they need to convey. Um, do you provide sort of nitty gritty resources to help, you know, offer examples or things along yes, those? Yes, we do. And we go even beyond that and we actually provide pitch coaches. <laughs> so because uh -huh. we believe that we need to, uh, all of us, can always improve upon our, our pitch, our delivery. And so mm -hmm. if you become part of the organization, you have access to coaches, access to mentors um, to provide you those like very you know, granular examples. That's, that, that's great. So it's so useful. Um, let's see, we have, um, we have, how much time do we have? I think um, a few more minutes. Um, we do have another, um, another question from the audience. Um, this one's for Armin. How is the Gulf Stream um, being affected by climate change? Since you're right there in the thick of it, 
We, we all hear, um, you know, rumblings of the Gulf Stream slowing down. Can you, yeah. can you speak to that? Um, yeah, you know, earlier I mentioned, you know, that the Gulf Stream is a really powerful current and it, it brings water, warm water from the Gulf of Mexico into the Atlantic Ocean. So it brings it up um, and directly, I, I mentioned earlier, it, it impacts weather patterns um, for areas like the Eastern coast of the US and as far as Europe. And so climate change can significantly impact those global ocean circulations, just like the Gulf Stream. And through extension, the Gulf of Mexico affects global patterns uh, like temperature and precipitation. Some of the largest countries in terms of where it touches is, is, the, uh, is the United States, Mexico, and Cuba. And there's roughly about 37 million people that inhabit that coastline. Um, and the economy in the area, specifically of the Gulf Coast, is dominated by industries related to energy, fishing, agriculture, and tourism, ecotourism. Um, you know, here's the thing though. Uh, we understand that the Gulf of Mexico is being impacted by global warming because it just makes the, war the waters more warm. Whenever we have uh, hurricanes um, coming through and they touch the Gulf of Mexico, that is like fuel to the fire. Um, we've seen hurricanes like Hurricane Katrina whenever it passed over Florida, uh, it simmered out for a little bit. Uh, and then it was able to uh, touch the Gulf of Mexico and take up more warm water. And it turned even worse and hit Louisiana. It was catastrophic, millions, billions of dollars in damages. And that's just um, the, the, the money, that's the quantifiable. But the lives that it changed were, were horrific. Louisiana has never been the same uh, since hurricanes like Katrina, but that was just Katrina. We've seen more hurricanes in the Gulf of Mexico since. Um, and so what we have also noticed as as these systems are going through the Gulf of Mexico and changing the water chemistry, changing up the sediment, uh, displacing you know, land figures and displacing um, the sediment in the water, that's being trickled up. And so you're seeing some sediment that has only ever been located in, in, in South Texas, the South Texas coast, all the way up as far as Maine. Uh, and so that's just an example of how, in, in, in the big picture, all of these systems, all of our world's oceans are connected and so if we're not taking care of the global picture, if, if we're not taking care of our regions like the Gulf of Mexico, we are influencing the lives of others. Uh, here, I mentioned the sediment one because if we're taking sediment from the South Texas coast and it's you know, being dumped off in the, the, as far as Maine, we are changing the environment. We are changing the, the area of where that biodiversity, that biota uh, relies on. And so you're impacting then the, the, the food web the, the ecosystem, that specific system. And so you can trigger, uh, you can trigger, um, you know, mass biodiversity loss. Uh, and, and these aren't things of fiction, these are real. Scientists have been saying this for, for forever. Anyways, so in terms of climate change, the Gulf of Mexico, it's impacting the Gulf of Mexico in a, in a, in a terrible way. It's making the waters really, really warm. Um, of course, we've seen things like sea level rise, a, lot, a loss of biodiversity. The South Texas coast, specifically Corpus Christi, where I've been born and raised, um, it's the it's the birdiest city in America. And we are starting to see less and less birds throughout the year. And that's very scary and startling. We have held that title for at least a decade now. Um, but uh, that is just a real tangible example of how our, our, our activities, the things that we do, our everyday decisions have real meaningful impact um, and, and detrimental impact to coastal communities and regions like the Gulf. Yeah. Well, it certainly does underscore how we are so, so interconnected. It is one world ocean, even though we, we name our different ocean basins, we are all totally connected. Well, it looks like we're almost out of time, but before we go, I'd love to get um, just some final words and advice from from you, um, maybe Daniela, maybe you could share some of your final thoughts and, and advice for, for our startups and for, for the general public. Absolutely, I, I would say that what has been on my mind during this UN Ocean Conference and after spending so much time with our youth leaders is the importance of disrupting the status quo. Mm -hmm. There's there's systems in place, there's regulations in place, but it doesn't mean that they can't change. And it doesn't mean that they have been working for us. They've actually been working against us. So I would encourage everyone to not settle and to demand more from every single industry sector, government infrastructure, 
and not just take things as given because it is truly up to our generation to to disrupt things, to re-engineer systems and to, and to ask policymakers what exactly they're going to do in the next three years. Uh, we, we can't hold off until the year 2050 because it will be too late for any big ambitious plan that they might have and they might not even be in office at that point. Um, but it's truly around disruption, around leadership and around urgency. And that's what I would encourage all of you to consider as you're building your own projects, as you're having conversations, as you're trying to hold people accountable um, to meeting these really immediate goals. Yes, I think the time is to, we need to be impatient. <laughs> the urgency requires it. Um, and we do, we need to, we, we cannot just sit back. It's um, the time is absolutely now. Um, Armin, fin final words. I'll I'll try to keep it brief. Um, I, there's but there's we so much to say in terms of it's, <laughs> it's preparation. Uh, and I've got at least one thing in, in terms of what um, investors can do uh, for listening to to young people. It's, they can at least learn to listen, to comprehend, and to unlearn. That's another big thing. Unlearning. We there are systems in place that have. Um, perpetuated uh, you know, injustices throughout communities. And so unlearning those, those systems that we may not be aware of, uh, that we're contributing to, um, unlearning is, is a big part of that. The other thing I would say for organizations, for startups is look at what kind of office culture you are developing. And in, in, in the office, in, in my office at the Gulf of Mexico Youth Climate Summit, we understand that we're trying to create a culture that nourishes bold ideas innovative solutions to some of our region's most daunting issues. And as a young, organi or as a young organization, um, we want to make sure that some of our, our best practices are captured in text um, or in our workspaces in order to really maintain uh, our dynamic people first operation. We collaborate with many of the Gulf Coast experts ranging from topics from you know, green solutions and blue economies and social change. And at the forefront, at the forefront of our work, we understand that the value of people coexisting equitably alongside our planet and nature. That's what's driving our boat and that's what keeps us thinking ocean smart. Um, and the last thing I'll add is this awesome quote from Jacques Cousteau. He, he, he says something along the lines of, for most of history, people have had to fight nature to survive. And in this century, and I'll add in this decade, this past few, few years, we are beginning to realize that in order to survive, we have to protect it. Thank you so much. Yes, no, absolutely well said. Um, unlearning our unjust systems, demanding more, not standing for the status quo. These are, um, these are absolutely critical. We have no time to waste, it's all hands on deck. So you, you two have been so inspiring. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we, um, I'd love to just, Thank you for your time. Thank you for your passion. Thank you for all that you're doing for the ocean. Um, and thank you. I also want to thank everyone viewing today, especially to the viewers around the globe for bringing entrepreneurs together to be part of this conversation. Um, and even though we have um, today's program is over, we don't want to stop this conversation. We want to keep it going um, about entrepreneurship. And I, I encourage everyone to check back with the GIST network.org. And um, this is one of many amazing conversations that you can access online. So please check that out. And, um, and thank you once again. Um, I, I'll um, look for, I, please look forward to other upcoming GIST events and programming like this. Thank you again and go forth. <laughs>